Good evening. Good evening. All right. Well, uh, first of all, on behalf of the Haitian American uh, Chamber of Commerce of Massachusetts, along with the League of uh, uh, Women Voters of Massachusetts, we'd like to welcome each and every one of you to a Block to Mayor and Ward 2 School Committee Forum. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers um, uh, for organizing this event, um, Vedna, and everybody else who's been involved. Please give them a round of applause for this. Having said that, I want to speak briefly about the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're uh, the leading organization advocating on behalf of Haitian American businesses and allied businesses in Massachusetts. Um, and having said that, we also understand that the issues that will be discussed today, uh, the questions that will be asked, they're extremely important, not only for um, uh, the business owners that we represent, but also for the Haitian American community um, in particular, along with everybody along with the community at large. Uh, we understand that voting is uh, an important right, it is a fundamental right, and it's one of those sacred rights that we have as citizens of this country, because that's how we build a, a community, and certainly this is how we build a country. Now, without any further ado, we'll, I will introduce you to our um, moderator for this evening, Elizabeth uh, Foster oh, no. Nolan. Welcome um, to the, tonight's uh, forum. We appreciate everyone being here. What I would like to do is ask the school committee candidates, uh, Mr. Donegan and Ms. Rivas Mendez, to join us at the front uh, so we can uh, begin the forum shortly. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to uh, thank um, the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts, as well as the Haitian American uh, Chamber of Commerce of Massachusetts. Uh, this has been a great collaboration. Um, we are very excited. This is the first time we've uh, collaborated with them, but it's been a very good process and an enjoyable time to get to know um, about this great organization. And we are both nonpartisan organizations. The League of Women Voters of Massachusetts is nonpartisan. Uh, it's a grassroots organization. We will be celebrating our 100th anniversary in 2020, which is very exciting. Uh, the League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in local, state, and national government. We also uh, develop positions um, and on issues, and we advocate. Uh, however, the League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Uh, so we like to let people know that as we begin this, and it's very similar to you know being uh, with understanding and echoing what we just heard about voting being a fundamental right. Um, we were able to do voter registration earlier today, and we think that that's really a key piece of all of this, that, to get everybody out to vote. And the purpose of this evening is to educate people. The forums that the League of Women Voters does really are for educational purposes, so that people are informed, they can listen to the candidates, and they can make informed, educated decisions about who they're going to vote for on November 5th, which I'm sure you'll hear several times this evening. Um, but uh, prior to tonight, all of the candidates received the information about how we would run this forum. For education of the audience, I'm going to go through that one time this evening um, so that you understand what is happening. Um, one of the things I would like to do as we begin this, as we always do, phones, iPads, everything, please shut off, make sure that we don't have one of those where I have to look out in the audience and go, really? Um, just silence them, make sure that we don't have those so that we're not interrupted. Um, the ground rules for all of us here is that um, we request you treat all the candidates fairly. Um, we ask you to remain quiet during the forum, and at the end, we're more than happy to have you applaud uh, for the candidates, but it takes time away from the candidates if you applaud after an answer. Um, and there is literature outside for the candidates. If you're interested in that, um, they have brought that there. Um, and thank you all of you. Nobody has any campaign literature or buttons on in here, so I don't have to say anything about that. So I do appreciate that. As you can see, we have a camera here. Brockton Access TV is uh, filming this, and it will be available um, up until the election. We do ask that there is no 
um, taping of this because this is a League of Women Voters event and we'd like to have this aired in its entirety <coughs> so that you get a full understanding of what is going on. So for this evening, um, each candidate will be given two minutes for opening statements. They will be given uh, 90 seconds for each answer to their question and a minute for their closing statements. There is no rebuttal, um, as, this, as I said earlier, is an in, uh, informational forum. Um, and the opening statements will be d done on a random draw that we did earlier with the candidates. Um, closing statements will be in reverse order, and then we alternate who gets to answer the question first. Important people, timekeepers, front row. They were the ones that will keep you on your toes, um, and they will uh, prompt you when you get to 30 seconds, um, and then there will be a stop sign for you to stop. If you are in the middle of a sentence, please complete it. If you are running on, I will say thank you, and we will move on to the next question. Um, so, if we are ready, um, we will um, begin the evening, and for the opening, um, which again is two minutes for school committee, Mr. Donegan is uh, drill number one. So I will ask you to begin, and thank you for joining us. Okay. Thank you. My name is Anthony Donegan. Good evening to everyone. I want to be your Ward 2 school representative. I'm a lifelong Brocktonian. I'm an attorney. I have a local practice here and very active, and I attended the Brockton schools where my mother taught, and I put two sons through the schools. I've seen them from the good and the bad. I've also served the school committee. No one will work harder for Brockton students than I will. The qualities and, and priorities I'll bring are relevant experience, expertise, advocacy, and a strong focus on equity and fairness. As a parent, I value the education my kids received and the experiences they had there. However, things were not always wonderful. I occasionally dealt with administrators and teachers who really don't have a favorable view of Brockton. And, uh, and I'm also a parent of biracial children, and we've had to overcome certain cultural biases and, and misperceptions as parents of those students. Um, I know the frustration and anger that parents can feel at times when they're dealing with school administrators and, and teachers and school committee people. I also know the pride of watching my kids graduate, and I'm forever grateful for the, to, for the wonderful people who guided them along the way. I'll work to help parents and students improve relations. I served the school committee in 2011 and 2012. I worked to balance budgets and negotiated union contracts. I hired and evaluated a superintendent. As the parent of a child on the autism spectrum, I have a keen interest in special education, and our committee, under my watch, exercised its authority and mandate for the first time to participate in the hiring of a, of a department head. As a lawyer, I represent families in juvenile court. I've seen and felt their pain, and I've worked as a school committee man to, to make sure that, our, that we focus on keeping our kids out of the courts and keeping them out of the criminal justice system. Again, my name is Anthony Donegan, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rios Mendez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Rivas Mendez. First and foremost, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the American and the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce of Massachusetts for organizing this forum and ensuring that voters and the community have the chance to learn about the issues affecting them and the candidates seeking. The, to represent them. I am a Latin American local mother. When you see me, you will most likely see my one-year-old son. I am an educator that teaches special education. I work with high schoolers on a daily basis with learning and behavioral disabilities. I am a resident whom you will see at the Westgate Market Basket or at Vicente on Pleasant Street. I am a homeowner of Ward 2. I have a strong background in education with a bachelor's from College of the Holy Cross and a master's from Boston University in teaching and curriculum with a focus in special education. I am truly passionate about education and I love what I do. My husband is a Brockton native who was enrolled in the Brockton public school systems. When we decided to get married, we chose Brockton to be our home and a place to raise our family. This is the place we plan on living, playing, and staying. 
I've fallen in love with the people, the community, and the love for Brockton. I admire that many professionals have gone through this school system and continue to call Brockton their home, desiring to see their children also cross the stage with a cap and gown like they once did. The reason why I'm running for school committee war two is because I strongly believe that as a collaborative community, we can work more closely together to ensure our district is getting the support and resources it needs to give all of our children a high quality education. I'd like to bring my lived experiences and lens to support how we serve each of our students and work to solve the issues we are up against. I believe we can, we will, and we must. Together, we can empower parents to advocate for their children. We will encourage all students to unlock their full potential, and we must ensure that every child receives a high quality instruction because they deserve nothing less than that. I ask for your vote, November 5th, 2019. Thank you, Centurios Mendes. Thank you. We'll now move on to the question portion of this evening. Uh, the candidates have not been provided with the questions in advance, uh, so this is the first time they are hearing them. Uh, we did solicit information to get uh, voters' input in the questions that we developed here. Um, again, reminder, you'll have 90 seconds for these questions. Mr. Donegan. In collaboration with the mayor, school administration, and teachers, what can you as a school committee member do to improve student achievement and ensure that everyone who graduates is either college ready or assisted with alternative pathways to success? Well, I think the first and foremost, we have to focus on the budget and make sure that the resources that we have are allocated appropriately. Um, I, I've been on the school committee before. I, when I lived in Ward 3, I was a school committee person and I worked closely with administrators and school teachers and again as a parent. So I, I have a solid understanding of what we need to do to have the infrastructure in place to, to ensure that they succeed. Can you repeat the question? I sure can. In collaboration with the mayor, school administration, and teachers, what can you as a school committee member do to improve student achievement and ensure that everyone who graduates is either college ready or assisted with alternative pathways to success? So I am, um, this is education is my daily life. Um, I know that Mike Thomas recently did an A plus program, which is an eighth grade credit recovery that he has implemented. I think that the, just being able to speak to, speak to parents, being a personable person will allow me to represent them in the sense of helping them and empowering them to advocate for their resources, but also know the skills of how to use the resources that are already in place. Um, once parents are able to do that, I think that would influence a lot of our students to do the same. Um, and as a representative, working collaboratively with the mayor, the school administration, the teachers, having um, those either coffee talks or just talks in general will allow me to continue to do that. Thank you. Ms. Rivas Mendez, in an era of more limited school financial resources, how will you enlist support for additional public school spending from voters with and without children in the district? How will I say that? How will you get support for additional public school spending from voters with and without children in the district? Well, right now, the bill that is trying to be um, that is trying to be passed, the Chapter 70, is to be able to give us more funding because as we as we qualify as a gateway city, um, other ways that we can um, encourage parents. I think I'm understanding the question that how to, how are we going to get more budget? Can you repeat it? Sorry. It's okay. In an era of more limited school financial resources. How will you enlist support for additional public school spending from voters who have children in the schools and voters who don't have children in the schools? So additional support from voters um, would be educating them. One important thing that you said, the more knowledge that they have, the more knowledge that they know the, the, the things that are in place, the infrastructures and the structures that we have, I think will encourage them to be invested and to want to um, invest in the education in place. And I think Brockton is a community that, as I was speaking to a few people earlier, that they continue to be invested even as their, even as their kids have gone through the system. Thank you. Mr. Donovan. 
Thank you. I, I mean, I, I apologize. You've already said it twice. But That's okay. One, one last time. In an era of more limited school financial resources, how will you enlist support for additional public school spending from voters with and without children in the district? Okay. Well, one thing that uh, we are very lucky for in Brockton is many of our residents, as, a, as myself, we are very proud of our school system. We've had a wonderful school system over the years. Our special education, and as a parent of a special education student, I, I know this firsthand, is, is among the best in, in the area. Um, as I say, most, I think most people know, whether or not they have children, they know that a good school system is fundamental to a good city. We need, not only do we need to make sure that our, you're going back to your first question, that our kids become productive citizens, we also need to make sure that they don't become a burden on our, on our community as well. So everyone has an interest in educating their kids, not just moms and dads. Um, in, in terms of securing funding, is that the other part of the question? Well, one thing that we, in Brockton, we do focus a great deal on Chapter 70 because our, our tax base is, isn't as large as many of the other communities that surround us. So uh, we, there is currently some, some legislation that's hopefully going to pass over the next several days. We will be getting somewhat of, a, of an improved financial picture from that. And that's, as a school committee person, I would focus very hard on making sure that, that those resources are allocated appropriately. Thank you. Ms. Rivas Mendez, um, what do you see as the top two opportunities and the top two challenges for the Brockton Public Schools for the 2019 2020 school year? The top two opportunities and the top two challenges, right? So, one huge opportunity that I think we have is if the bill. Um, if the bill does pass, we will be able to have more of those teachers that were cut. Um, we will be able to hire them back. Also, have more after school programs for our schools. Um, and that's if the bill passes. And then another opportunity that we can have is have more rigor in our schools. So, one thing that our district is struggling with is about 72% of our kids are high needs and that word is so vague um, and hard to define but one of the components part of that word is being on grade level so how do we encourage our kids to be on grade level and those that are on grade level or advanced how do we provide resources for them to continue to have programs such as that we have in place like the gifted program and the ivy league program how do we build the, more of those programs for kids that need more of that rigor. I was speaking to one, two Brockton high schoolers that, that graduated, and one of them said, you know, when I went to college, now that I'm a nurse, I felt like I wasn't prepared, like the, the college students currently there, because we have to remember, Brockton's amazing, but when we go off to college, we're competing against other cities around, and also other na national students worldwide as well. So giving them that rigor, that instructional high quality value of being able to be ahead of their grade. Thank you. May I, may I have the question again? I'm yes, sorry. you may. What do you see as the top two opportunities and top two challenges for the Brockton Public Schools <coughs> in 2019 to 2020? Okay, the top two, I, I think the top one would be the receipt of those funds, those Chapter 70 funds. Um, that will give us a, an opportunity to focus more, first and foremost, on classroom teachers. Um, many, many, many of our classrooms are overcrowded, and we need to focus, we need to fix that, we need to fix that right away. Uh, so having those additional funds will help us do that. There's also, of course, um, as, as my sister knows, there, with special education, for example, you need to have a lot of support personnel. Brockton schools have lost a lot of Brockton, uh, excuse me, a lot of support personnel, MTAs, paraprofessionals, and the like. So we're going to be able to replace those. Um, the other, the other um, opportunity, and challenge, right? So the other, the other opportunity that, that we have is again to fo focus on getting our kids college ready or, or. Um, excuse me. <laughs> focus on getting them college ready or ready for the workplace. 
So again, with the receipt of those funds, that's going to enable us to to focus on those things and to actually be successful in these areas. Thank you. Okay. Now, we, uh, the next question, since both of you, we've been pel pelting with a few budget-related questions, we're now going to put you into a world where um, Brockton Public Schools receives the intended funding um, that is up at the State House. Um, how would you prioritize spending that? What were your um, what are your top three priorities for spending that additional funding? Mr. Donnelly. So, so my, my top three, would, as, I, as I said in the last question, would be to, to re, uh, repopulate our teachers and, and, and support staff. The other area that I think we need to focus on too is we have a lot of untapped resources in Brockton. Um, what I would like to see would be uh, some, some infrastructure work done to fix up to Brockton High School and the other schools uh, to perhaps get some money from, from the state to match us in, build, in building new school facilities. Uh, we also have resources right here in town that, that could be utilized. The Shaw Center and the Campanelli Stadium were both uh, at one point under the control of the Brockton school system. Uh, they are now owned by the city and any revenue that comes from those entities goes to the city. We think that, I think that, that those entities should be brought back under the number of the school system so that we could also utilize the resources that are coming in from those, from those two um, sources to, and to use that to help our children with academics, the arts, music, sports, um, and, and also to enhance our curriculum, broadcast media, hotel, restaurant, and training, those kinds of things. Um, three, we're, good, we're hypothetically speaking, if we do get the budget, the three top things. Okay, so my number one top is, as we know, our diversity in our schools, right? We have about 60% African American students, 2% Asians, about 16% Latinos, about 18% whites, and 4.5% that are multi-race. And we only have 8% of teachers that are people of color. One hot topic that we've been talking about recently has been hiring teachers of color, but not just hiring them. How do we retain them? That's huge. So one one main thing that I would definitely do is once they're in the system, so recently there was an article that came out that there's two scholarships in honor of Carpenter, rest his soul, um, was that they would allow Brocktonian kids that went through the Brockton High School go to Bridgewater and be able to come back as teachers. But how do we retain those? As we know, the Massachusetts Licensed Teacher Certification is extremely hard. How do we give them workshops to be able to be there? How do we um, give them teacher new development programs to maintain them? As we know, you get, the research has shown, teachers get burned out the first five um, years. The second thing, we've been struggling with discipline, right? How do we train continuous learning for teachers' administration to have cultural competency? A lot of times they don't have that background. They're not, under, they're not seeing kids eye to eye. So that's a huge one. And lastly, I do um, agree with um, Mr. Donegan, the infrastructures of our schools. Um, a lot of complaints that I hear from parents is special education, not being in the best conditions, not having elevators, not being handicapped. Those would be the three main top that I Thank you. Have. Ms. Rios Mendez, with regards to Brockton School District programs for special education students, English language learners, and gifted students, how will you assure the district meets the diverse needs of learners? So I think I touched it on the other question on my answer. Definitely continuous teaching and learning for admin teachers and all staff to be able to understand what is special education, what resources they need, and educate their parents. A lot of parents aren't coming to the IEP meetings. They're not understanding how to advocate for their child. So giving them that continuous education among school and that collaboration with the parents. For ELLs, providing programs where, um, as I said before, a lot of our students, 72% are not being at grade level. A lot of them is because of a language. So how do we create programs or schools where we allow those students to participate and get those resources. One big conflict that's happening in the Brockton High School is American students born and raised here where their parents are immigrants and those that are soon coming, right? They're, 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 there's a huge conflict where there's bullying and how do we create education among the American students that were born and raised here to 
that lack of ignorance, that, th that ignorance that they have to be able to meet the ELL students so they can feel more comfortable, they can have a safe learning environment and be able to have that support where they are right now. Thank you. Mr. Donegan. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to Sure. Ask you. With regards to Brockton School District's programs for special education students, English, English language learners, and gifted students, how will you assure the district meets the diverse needs of learners? Well, it's, I think that the, the schools are, are, are on the right track in terms of professional development for their teachers. Uh, again, it comes back to a question of budget and allocating those resources appropriately when, when the, those monies come in. So I think that a, a quick answer to that is the um, simply ensuring that the, uh, the resources are allocated appropriately. But also, I think that you need to recognize that the, the professionals, the, the teachers, the administrators, have a pretty good idea of what they need to do to ensure the diversity. There, is, there are programs right now amongst uh, the, the administrators that are trying to focus on helping faculty uh, be more understanding of the diversity of the students when they teach. Um, so I, th I think that that's an important key aspect and I, I think that having money come in will allow them to focus on those kinds of initiatives. Thank you. Um, starting with Mr. Donegan, uh, a recent article, um, maybe not so recent, but this year, uh, Brockton Enterprise talked about the Barr Foundation um, awarding Brockton Public Schools $150,000 for a year-long study of a potential new and smaller high school dubbed the Promise High School. It's intended to boost students who have struggled in elementary and middle school and are off track to graduate. It will address the non-academic factors that affect the student's ability to do well. Presuming Brockton receives the associated grant of $750,000 to start the process of launching this school, what are your thoughts on developing another innovation school? Well, I'm, I'm all for other innovation schools, and I think that we also the receipt of funds will enable us to focus on some of the ones we have, such as our Edison Academy. Um, I am aware of the, the program that uh, Kelly Silva is, is the person who's heading up the exploration of that. I think it's an exceedingly important component. One of the things that I hear from parents as I travel around the ward and have heard in the past is a lot of kids really aren't ready emotionally or any other way for Brockton High School. Uh, there's over 4,000 students there now, and some kids just can't can't do it. They they can't spend a day surrounded by all those people. Um, so I think that the Promise High School is a great opportunity to focus uh, some effort on those regular ed kids who just need a, a different setting. And I'm I'm very very encouraged by that. Thank you, Ms. Ruiz Mendez. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think. Um, as we know, the Brockton High School only has four adjustment counselors for about 4,300 students. So I think it would be amazing to have, especially for the support of our student with disability, not just regular, it's just for regular ed students or for all students, correct? For yeah. all students. So I think especially for students with disability, ELLs, like the previous question, what supports would we give them? So this would be one of the supports that hypothetically would be amazing to have. Um, Brockton is big on persisting and helping students with conduct disorder. As we know, we have um, alternative um, schools, the Frederick Douglass and the Champion High School. And because we continue to persist to keep those students that are behavioral that need more support behaviorally, we have, we've had in the past a high suspension rate. So having a school like this that is providing them a safe learning environment, that is providing them with emotional well-being, I think would be amazing and that suspension rate can go down and a lot of those kids that are known to be incarcerated may, may have a chance in life. Thank you. Ms. Rivas Mendez. Um, what can the school committee do to help attract and retain a diverse professional staff in the Brockton schools? Please give some specific ideas. Um, I think me as a, a teacher of color myself, I think um, the importance of the continuous learning, but also providing a space where teachers of color have to be able to talk to one another on how to support their students, but also to educate one another. And having also spaces where they're educating, but not putting it all on them, but you know, hiring, con there's consults 
it's a huge part um, where people consult others on cultural responsiveness and cultural competency. So having professional people come in and educating the, the teachers in place now and um, people of color so they can feel like they are heard, they can feel like Brockton Public Schools is also part of who they are because as we know, if there's only an 8% people of color, a lot of teachers, and we're talking about 8% across the whole district, right? So I might be the only person of, the only teacher of color in one building. So how do we support that teacher to keep them there? I think providing them with affinity groups, providing them with continuous um, professional development and continuous, um, sorry, and continuous, um, definitely continuous, collaboration among where they're educated and saying their concerns to admin and teachers because as we know there's always room for improvement to support those teachers and retain them. Thank you. Mr. Donegan. Okay, thank you. Um, I, th I think if I, if I understand your question correctly, to attract, to attract uh, minority teachers and, and support them when they're here? To, to attract? To attack and yes, attract and retain a professional, and retain, okay. a diverse professional staff. Right. So I think that's a really fundamental American problem. It's not just in Brockton. In fact, I know that the uh, the, the Brockton schools are roughly the same as the the charter school, the Champion Charter School in Brockton. For excuse me, not the, the yes, the Champion Charter School, uh, in terms of a low percentage of minority teachers. So I think that. Colleges, universities need to do, and Brockton schools can work with Bridgewater to to do things to attract more minority candidates, and people who want to be teachers. Um, so, and I and I'm encouraged that Brockton actually does have a diversity coalition right now. They they they're actually focused. Their professional people are, are focused on on making or helping their teachers be more aware of the cultural differences they have with the, with the students who they teach. So I think, I think that this is an important and ongoing issue, and I think that, that we need, as, as a school committee, to stay focused on it and to continue to encourage our, our, our administrators to seek out and hire more minorities as teachers. Thank you. You guys can breathe. We're going into our last question. <laughs> Um, and we will start with Mr. Donegan. With such a culturally diverse population in Brockton, what strategies would you recommend to increase family engagement across all grade levels in the schools? Okay, well one, one big issue is uh, I think the, we have a high percentage, as, as my sister pointed out, the, um, we have a high percentage of English language learners. Um, I, right now the, the community schools is I think under new leadership. I think that we really need to encourage our community schools and our school administrators to allocate more of the resources that we hope are coming to uh, to focus on in helping new students and new new families uh, learn English and, and feel as though they're part of, part and included in the school community. Um, if, I'm sorry if I could ask you to just. Repeated. With such a culturally diverse population, what strategies would you recommend to increase family engagement across all grade levels of the schools? So I think, yes, uh, that, that's uh, an important aspect of it. I think that the parent, uh, parent associations, I think we need to focus, to the extent that we can, more resources at those activities so that we get minority parents involved and in, in, in other a diverse group of parents involved and interacting with one another, not, both within and outside the school. Strategies for parent engagement. I find that food always works. Parents will come if food is being provided. That's definitely the high up on that list. But besides that, other strategies, um, definitely education. Um, as we know, it's such a diverse population, some parents may not be documented in this country. And because of the politics going on, they live in a state of fear. Living in a state of fear, they associate the schools with the politics, even though the schools have nothing to do with it. Therefore, educating them, reaching out, having home visits, right? Encouraging admin teachers to understand their cultures so we don't just meet the student where they are, but we meet the parent where they are. We can also empower them by 
just having those freaking phone calls, not negative phone calls, positive phone calls up there. And me, as I am soon gonna be having my child in the system, God willing, um, I will be, I, I would be more than, than um, on the seat, be, be part of this parent engagement because it's something that I, in the high school level especially, is something that we definitely struggle with, especially in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade years. Ninth grade years, that joy, but the 10th, 11th, and 12th, what can we do more? I think, number one, that empowerment of educating our parents, teaching them the resources that we have so they know, and teaching them how to access those resources. Thank you. We will now move on to closing statements. A reminder, these are one minute closing statements and reverse order of the opening statements. Um, so the closing, we'll start with you, Ms. Riva Mendez. Once again, I believe we can, we will, and we must. Together, we can empower parents to advocate for their children. We will encourage our students to unlock their full potential, and we must ensure that every child receives a high-quality education because they deserve nothing less than that. So I ask for your vote, and I encourage you to reach out to me with any questions on November 5th, 2019. Thank you, Cynthia rivas Mendes. Yes, again, my name's Anthony Donegan, and I'm asking for your vote on November 2nd. Again, I've served the school committee before, and, and, and I, I've enjoyed it. I have a great passion for it, and I want to do it again. And I, again, I hope that you will vote for me. Um, I, I have, I, again, I have uh, both, I've had two children go through the school system. I've, I've experienced great joy and great dismay in my in, encounters with the school personnel. And it's my, it's my great, desire to go back on and to work with them and to ensure that the children of Brockton have a, a good opportunity for, for education to be college ready or to be ready for the workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening.